Today's video is sponsored by Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club covers all of your grooming needs, shower, oral care, deodorant, and shaving naturally. If you're a long-time subscriber to any of my channels, you probably are aware that I don't shave my beard anymore, but you do know that I shave my head, and that experience has become so much easier, so much more pleasant, thanks to Dollar Shave Club and their high-quality blades. Dollar Shave Club sent me their ultimate shave starter set, which I have in front of me here. Of course, it comes with the razor and the blades, which I have uh, apparently on my last one. <laughs> this is their uh, sleek matte black handle. It comes with two variants, four blade, all terrain or six blade extra close i got the extra close one because i like a close shave there's the prep scrub which you use before there's the shave butter which you use well you put it on before and then you use it during and then there's the post shave dew which you put on afterwards me personally post shave dew is where it's at it's kind of like a really nice moisturizer my head gets a little bit dry after a shave and my face used to get a little bit dry after a shave so i guess i just have dry skin but this is fantastic keeping you hydrated and of course dollar shave club wants to own own the bathroom experience so they have other great products too the sunscreen acne spot treatment even ball spray what for your sweaty balls yes so right now you can visit dollarshaveclub.com forward slash brain food and get the ultimate shave starter set for only five dollars and why not round out your grooming routine by adding any of the other high quality products after that the restock box ships full-size products at the regular price and now let's get into today's video Put a frog in a pot of boiling water and he would immediately jump out. But put that same frog in a pot of cold water and raise the temperature gradually enough and it will be boiled alive. This evocative story has long served as a useful metaphor for complacency in the face of gradual change, being used in discussions of phenomena as diverse as climate change, abusive relationships, and encroaching government surveillance. And while the original experiment that established the principle is rarely mentioned, the science behind it is commonly accepted as facts. But, well, is it? Has anyone actually boiled a frog alive, and if so, did the frog really not try to escape? To begin with, the origins of the boiled frog fable lie in the work of 19th century German physiologist Friedrich Goltz, who in the 1870s set out to determine whether animals have a soul, and if so, where in the body was located. Goltz was particularly interested in fellow physiologist Edward Pfluger's concept of the spinal cord soul, the second seat of consciousness thought to exist separately from the brain. To this end, in 1872, Goltz placed frogs in cold water and slowly raised the temperature. According to contemporary British philosopher George Lewes, death occurred at around 40 degrees, while quietly the animal sat through all successions of temperature, never once manifesting uneasiness or pain, never once attempting to escape the impending death. This remarkable result was duplicated by German scientists Albert Heinzmann in 1872 and Karl Fratscher in 1875. So, well, Case closed, then, I suppose? Well, not quite, for this account leaves out one critical fact, that all the frogs in question had been pithed. Pithing is a laboratory technique which involves destroying a frog or other animal cerebrum, usually performed by inserting a needle into the back of the skull and sweeping it side to side. This destroys the animal's higher brain functions while leaving the brainstem intact, meaning that while the animal is no longer conscious, all its involuntary functions such as heartbeat and breathing carry on, allowing the function of these organs to be studied during dissection. Goltz pithed his frogs to determine whether the supposed spinal cord soul could produce the same conscious response as the brain. As it could not, he deduced that the soul resided entirely within the brain. In reality, without the brain, a frog's nervous system is only capable of simple reflex, which a gradual enough increase in temperature does not trigger. However, when Goltz tried the same experiment with an intact frog, Goltz observed that a frog, when placed in water, the temperature of which is slowly raised towards boiling, manifests uneasiness as soon as the temperature reaches 25 degrees. Celsius and becomes more and more agitated as the heat increases, vainly struggling to get out, and finally, at 42 degrees Celsius, dies in a state of rigid tetanus. While this would seem to indicate that the myth holds true only under extremely specific conditions, other scientists, including Heinzmann, Fratcher, and Englishman William Sedgwick, also observed this phenomenon in normal, unpithed frogs. In Sedgwick's 1888 paper on the variation of reflex excitability in the frog induced by changes of temperature, this 
apparent contradiction is explained by the fact that the frog's thermal response is highly dependent upon the specific heating rate. According to Cedric, Galtz heated the water from 17.5 degrees Celsius to 56 degrees over the span of 10 minutes, a rate of around 3.8 degrees per minute, while Heinzmann raised the temperature from 21 to 31.7 degrees over 90 minutes, a rate of only 0.2 degrees per minute. Thus, according to Sedgwick, the truth appears to be that if the heating is sufficiently gradual, no reflex movements will be produced, even in the normal frog. If it be more rapid, yet take place at such a rate to be fairly called gradual, it will not secure the response of the normal frog under any circumstances. Aside from the lethal temperature for most frogs being 40 degrees Celsius, nowhere near boiling alive, the myth of the boiling frog would thus appear to be confirmed. However, most modern biologists dispute the reality of the phenomenon, citing both the scarcity of credible experiments and the everyday observable behavior of frogs. Indeed, William Cedric himself admitted that many contemporary scientists, including M. Foster and Day Charchenow, observed that frogs still tried to escape from 25 degree water, no matter how slowly it was heated. More recently, scientists like University of Oklahoma zoology professor Dr. Victor Hutchison and Dr. George R. Zug, curator of reptiles and amphibians at the National Museum of Natural History, have openly refuted the notion, Zug stating that regardless of the heating rate, once an uncomfortable temperature is reached, if a frog has a means of getting out, it certainly would get out. Scientists even refute the seemingly logical first premise of the myth that a frog dropped in boiling water would jump out, with Harvard biology professor Douglas Melton stating, If you had a frog in boiling water, it won't jump out. It will die. If you put it in cold water, it will jump before it gets hot. They don't sit still for you. According to Melton, when exposed to extremely high temperatures, a frog's muscles tend to immediately seize up. Thus, paralyzed and unable to escape, death follows soon after. Of course, none of these contemporary scientists have attempted to replicate the experiments of Galt, Sedgwick, and others for the simple reason that the boiling of frogs alive is rather frowned upon these days, despite mass killings of frogs for dissection of students being the gold standard of high schools the world over. Nevertheless, the general consensus is that from more ethically observable frog behavior and experiments that do exist, it would seem to be the case that the whole slow boiling frog thing so often touted is just pure bunkum. And now for a bonus fact. Speaking of frogs in liquid, for centuries before refrigeration, an old Russian practice was to drop a frog into a bucket of milk. Why? Well, as Dr. Albert Lebedev of Moscow State University notes, for small portions of milk to drink, they used to put a frog inside. A small frog over there could prevent the milk from being spoiled. But does this actually work? Well, yeah, it kind of does. As to why, in 2010, scientists from the United Arab Emirates University made an announcement that the secretions from certain frog skins have antibacterial and antifungal properties. Using species native to African countries, they studied the compounds coming from the frogs, which are known as antimicrobial peptides and are a string of amino acids. After isolating these compounds, they began testing them against various bacterial infections. For instance, the dreaded Arachibacter, a drug-resistant bacterial infection that has been known to hit wounded soldiers in Iraq could potentially be fought with a compound found in the skin of a mink frog that is native to North America. Secretions from a foot-ill four-legged frog may have the potential to fight the well-known resistant MRSA staph skin infection. In 2012, scientists from Moscow State University decided to take this a step further by breaking down the compounds and studying the individual peptides. In a study entitled Composition and Antimicrobial Activity of Skin Peptidome of Russian Brown Frogs, published in the Journal of Proteome Research in November 2012, and using Russian brown frogs, which are edible and considered a delicacy by the way, they extracted secretions by applying electrodes. What came out was a cocktail of 76 different peptides that all had different properties. Michael Zaslov, now a professor at George Town University, but formerly a researcher with the National Institutes of Health, said in an interview that, What is amazing is that no two frogs have the same cocktail. They're all different and all beautifully tuned to deal with the microbes that these animals face. While all this may or may not be ultimately medicinally helpful for humans, beginning centuries ago, certain Russians seem to have been onto something by putting frogs into milk to stop it from spoiling. Although I think we can all agree that putting a frog in one's milk takes a backseat to the other age-old way to store milk without refrigeration, making it into cheese. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.